perfect grace has brought me to this place because of you I freely live my life to you oh God I give so I stand before you God I lift my voice cause you set me free so I shout out your name we love today wherever you are located know that you are not alone you are not alone we're still connected today we gather as one body one body one body because the church is not a building it never has been it never has been we gather today as one church one church to lift up one name the name of Jesus. 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 So wherever you are, today is the day the Lord has made. Today is the day to give him thanks. So let's unite. Let's worship. Let's praise his name. For he is worthy of it today and every day. Because we are still the church. We are 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 the church.
Perfect 
Good morning, Calvary. I'm um, glad that you are taking this time to be with us this, this Sunday morning. Looking forward to uh, sharing the word with you. Before we do that, I want to just remind you about what's coming up next Sunday. Uh, today is going to be the last Sunday that we are not meeting in the house uh, and worshiping together, and I'm very thankful for that. Next Sunday, May 3rd, make plans and preparations to be back in the house of the Lord. We will start our worship service at 1030. Uh, make plans to be here. Um, and we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to you being back in the house of the Lord. Um, today is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to be uh, focusing on, on an issue that I feel like is a very important issue. There's a lot of stuff that I feel like as a pastor, uh, when I'm looking at our congregation and I'm praying about what the Lord, uh, I, I can't just focus on one group. Um, I have a whole church that I, I pray for. I have a whole, whole flock that I have to deal with, various ages, all, all kind of uh, situations and all kind of uh, areas that, that need to be. And it all comes together as one to form this body. And it's, the enemy attacks in a lot of places. We see the enemy attack in our marriages. We see the enemy attack in our jobs. We see the enemy attack in our finances. But, but one of the areas that... Uh, that we need to address and we need to make sure that, that we are, are bringing to light and that we are doing what needs to be done and making preparations to fight and equipping ourselves to fight this fight is there is an attack upon our young people and of all ages. Um, we as parents, we as grandparents, uh, we need to understand that, that there is a major attack going on uh, across the church, across uh the denomination across the movement of God as, as, as Christians as a whole against our young people. And um, I, I want to take this, this time and I want us to focus a little bit on, on what we can do as, as parents and, and as young people to, uh, to, help, uh, to help address this issue. And I've got with me a very special guest today, uh, our Youth and Discipleship Director of the Church of God in South Carolina, uh, I call him Scotty, but uh, he's he's my best friend. Uh, but Pastor Scotty Hager is with us today. Bishop Scotty Hager is is with us, and and me and him we, we're we're going to talk a little bit today about some of the things that I feel like um, we need to we can we can pull out and address some of the issues that I feel like that are important uh, for our young people um, as a whole. But um, uh, before we do that, I want you just to uh, just to explain uh, why you do what you do, Scott. Why, why are you in the position that you're in? What is your heart? What is, what is your heart of ministry here? You're a youth and discipleship director, but what, what, what motivates you to do that? What, what is it? Thanks, Pastor Trey, for letting me be here today and for giving me this opportunity. I really do appreciate it. Uh, to answer your question, when we took this role and left Walhalla, we just really felt like God was calling us to raise up spiritual pioneers that we had had generation after generation of spiritual settlers. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with settlers. You have to have settlers if you're ever going to have towns and cities. and they're going to, well, You have to have someone to settle those places. Right. But as the church of God and as people, and especially in this 21st century before the coming of Christ, I feel like the Lord was telling us, you need to raise up spiritual pioneers yeah. who will not be spiritual settlers in one place, but will take the gospel of the kingdom and will go into all the world and preach the gospel. Sure. And to be a generation that sets the fields on fire. To preach that Jesus is Savior, Sanctifier, Holy Ghost, Baptizer, Healer, and a soon coming King. Because young people today have a drive to want to do something. They want to be somebody. They have a drive inside of them to, to do great things. And I believe the Lord is setting up this generation to be a generation of spiritual pioneers. To go one last time into all the world. It's with everything they've got and win this world to Jesus Christ. I love that. Uh, and we've heard it all our life, but uh, the Lord's coming soon. 
Yes. And, you know, if there's ever been a, uh, a plea to say that we're seeing the signs of the times, I think it's now. Absolutely. And we need to make sure that we are, we are doing diligence as parents, as leaders, to make sure that we are, we are equipping not only ourselves, but we are making sure that our, our children are equipped with what they need to be able to fight this fight. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not only, and, and I don't want to reiterate what I've talked about in the past, but I don't believe that the Lord has just put us as fathers and, and mothers over our children to protect them physically. Right. But I think that there is a protection and there is a, there is a covering that we have to do as far as to protect their anointing to protect the calling that's been put over their life as well. And, and I don't think that we should take this lightly. I think this is, this is where it's a spiritual war here, and, and the enemy is, is, is out to attack them. Listen, we are, we are in a, a day that we have never seen before. Have you ever, in all that you're, you've been in ministry, you've pastored local churches, you've pastored church not far from here, great church, you, you was a youth pastor, now you're in state leadership. Have you ever seen the church being tested and I'm not saying necessarily attacked because I, I don't feel like we're hurt, but I do feel like it is a test. But have you ever seen the church be tested like it is where we not even be able to gather into the house of the Lord like we have? Never. I've never seen anything like this. Never even read of anything really like this before, and even in our history. Right. It is. Uh, this is something that is so far from the American church. But something great, though, I, in my spirit, and you tell me, in my spirit, I sense something great is about to birth out of this. It's funny you said that, and I want you to look. I've been writing because the Lord was speaking to me. Before there's, in history, when we've looked, before every major event or a, a major leader being born in Scripture or some, the people of God being brought out, right. there was something that happened among young people. When Moses was, was born to be the leader of God's people, to lead them out of Egypt into the promised land, what does Pharaoh do but says, let's kill the children? Right. When Jesus comes on the scene and is born to be the Messiah, what does, what does the king say that day? Right. We've got to find this one to kill the children. So they kill children to try to find this one. Well, here we are, what we believe is the, the, one of the greatest evangelistic days of the church. Something mighty is about to happen because abortion, they're killing children. Drug abuse, uh, children are dying. Methamphetamines, addiction. Uh, children are being murdered all over the world. They're being used in slave trafficking and sex trafficking. Yeah. It, it's, there is something major about to happen, and we can tell that because of what's happened before in Scripture. Children are under attack. Yeah. Young people are under attack, which lets us know the church better be ready because something oh, yeah. powerful is about to happen. And I think one of the, 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 the first things that we need to recognize is this, that there is an attack. Yes. I think that we, being naive and, and, and assuming that everything's okay, that those days need to be far gone behind us. Yes. Because uh, the assumption that our kids are okay and they can raise themselves and they can lead themselves, that needs to be deleted from our, our ministry mindset. We need to make sure that it is our responsibility. God has put them over us to make sure that that... God has put us over them, I'm sorry, to make sure that we lead them in the way that they need to go and to make sure that they are being nurtured in, through, through the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they, which leads me to what we're going to talk about, so that they can take what we've got. Yeah. Take it further. And take it further. Because this cannot stop with me and you. That's right. Um, there's a scripture, and the Lord laid the scripture on both me and you as, as we was preparing for this. I'm, I'm going to get you to read that scripture. We're in Psalms chapter 127. Um, read that scripture. I think it's uh, verses 3 and 4. Psalm 127, 3 and 4. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Is that not powerful? I, I was reading some of my... Um, in, in my, my my Bible, it has just some some notes here, and, and, and I like what it says. It says, too often children are seen as liabilities yeah. other than, than being looked at as assets. Right. And um, I think we have been guilty of that sometimes. Especially at tax time. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. 
If, if, if you're thankful <laughs> that the IRS is, is blessed you with those children, praise the Lord. Yeah. Um, but, um, and, and just FYI, I'm going to stop real quick and, and as a disclaimer, allow you to understand that, that me and Scotty have been thick as thieves all our life. And, and if we crack a smile, it's not because we're being disrespectful. Not at all. It's just because we, we have been through the ringer with each other. We uh, married each other's cousins. Our, our wives cousin. are first cousins, so now we're actually family. But um, we, we've, we've seen a lot of things, and, and we've just had a great time. But we're also raising kids in this generation. And how old are your kids? 14 and 8. 14 and 8. They are seeing things that me and you never saw. Never saw. I've got a 18-year-old. And a fifteen-year-old, and they're seeing things, you know, that that, and we're, and we're coming into this to where we need to understand that they need our help. So yeah. we're we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about as parents what we need to do, and in a little bit, I'm gonna bring our our uh, youth pastor Austin. He's gonna come up and he's gonna help us gear more to the young people. But we're talking about what what David is is writing here, and he says, "Children are a gift from the Lord. They're like arrows in a warrior's." hand um and i i, I want to ask this question and i i want us to dialogue on this a little bit for every parent that's listening right now every grandparent grandparents you can't sit on the sideline either um you, just because you've raised your kids and your kids have had children that doesn't mean that you get to sit on the bench now i'm not i'm not saying you need to be a babysitter i'm not now, but on a spiritual level, until you take your last breath, you are still in the army of the Lord. And those children still need spiritual leadership and guidance from you, yeah. okay? And I want us to take a hard look here. And this is a difficult question to ask. For every parent, for every grandparent, what's at stake here if we get this wrong? If we don't do this right, What's at stake if we allow this to slip through our hands? You know, I think that's a very, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. I think there's a lot of things at stake. Number one, I think the church is at stake because what we have enjoyed is freedom in the last 100, 200 years here in the North American church and the USA church. They're not enjoying this around the world, but that's coming here. There will be a time of persecution. Yeah. And if our children and grandchildren are not rooted in the word of the Lord and in who God is, then the church will be at stake 10, 20, 30, even 40 and years from now. And we'd be ignorant to argue against that for the very thing that we've gone through for the last two months. It's setting the stage up. Yeah. Not only the church, but I think our Pentecostal heritage is at stake here. Right. We have to still proclaim that there is the Spirit of God that not only dwells with men, but lives inside of us. Yeah. And that the gifts of that Spirit dwell inside of us, and we use those as we need them as the church. Why, why do we need those gifts? You know, I'm not trying to get off topic, but this is what's at stake. Why is it important that our kids get those gifts? Every yeah. good gift comes from the Father right. above. Every good gift comes from the Father above. I would not want my kids not to receive the gift of the Father. Yeah, that, That's a good gift that everyone, everyone that, that's provided for all. When the he Holy said, Spirit comes you, upon your children, you, and for those you shall off. receive what? When the Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power, endued from on high. What power does my kid have to have? This is, this is what's at stake. Yeah. If, if, if I don't get this right, then my son, who is 18, about to graduate high school, if, if I don't get this right as a parent, how is he going to know about the Holy Spirit and the fire that he's supposed to have? And, I, and I'm, 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 I'm not just focusing on... Uh, the gifts that we see in church. I'm talking about the gifts that he needs when he is tempted with something outside of the home, when he yep. is out from under my care. He needs that power. My daughter needs that power when someone comes and tries to tempt her with something. And it is my job. It is your job to make sure our kids, we have to make sure that they, they and that's what's at stake here. There's, there's other things at stake here. I, I, Christianity, the soul of our children. Man. The souls of their children. Think about think about going in and take a stroll down memory lane, but everybody in that's watching right now, I want you to think about twenty years ago. And I'm not saying we had it we we did it all right, because we we've we've stumbled and we did some things, you know. But um as a church as a whole, do you remember church services that just that have imprinted on your life, moves of God that imprinted on your life? that without a shadow of a doubt, you can look back and say, that was God. 
you know? Oh, absolutely. I, that was the norm for us growing up. Yeah. That every, especially Sunday nights, that's the night you didn't bring your girlfriend to church. That's the night you didn't bring your buddy from high if school to did, church. If you did, what was going to happen? The Holy Ghost was going to fall. And they was going to get there. The, the <laughs> preacher was going to lay hands on them, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the move of God was so real in our churches. Yeah. You didn't invite Baptist uh, girls to church on, on Sunday nights, <laughs> Not did on you? Sunday night. On Sunday nights. But um, we, we, but that's, that's what I'm talking about. We seen that. Healings. Deliverance. Absolutely. Demonic deliverance. Yeah. Power, though. It yeah. was undeniable power. Absolutely. It was not man manipulated. It was not conjured up stuff. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaking through an individual with the gift of tongues, the, the, the gift of interpretation in tongues, the power of God moving, people slain in the Spirit. Yeah. People sh- and, and, you know, and it being done the right way. In order. You know, in order. Uh, the, the Church of God camp meetings that we used to be Oh, in. Absolutely. Seeing the power of God move. I seen a service one time where a young boy come up and give just a few dollars, and before the offering was over with, hundreds of thousands of dollars were given for a dormitory. You remember that night? Uh, and seeing the power of God. That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. And this is what's at stake if we don't if we don't get this right. Now, as 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 long as youth and children are under our care, to what extreme, how far? Do you think that we as leaders, how much effort should we put into making sure that we get this right? You know, I, I was thinking, if you show me your checkbook, I can show you what's important. Yeah. And I think that there needs to be resources poured into our youth and our children's ministries to make sure that we're giving them not a third world, third world country on the back side of a building somewhere, but we're giving them the very best we can give them so that they will know that, hey, they're not just giving us what's left over, but the church cares enough about us to give us the very best as well. Because at the end of the day, there is nothing wrong with having savings accounts and money in the bank. But if we've got millions of dollars in the bank and our children are dying going to hell or yeah. Jesus comes back and there's, and, and there's no children with us in our churches, maybe we've missed it. How important are the parents, though? Parents are very important. But you said something earlier which sent me to Genesis the grandparents too. Oh, yeah. You know, with Jacob, when he's blessing Joseph's son, he calls in his grandchildren. Yes, he blesses his sons, but he calls in his grandchildren and blesses them. Yeah. The parents, are they are the hub. They are the everything. The very first attack recorded in Scripture was not on the church. It was on the family. Right. The very first attack in Scripture was not on a church. It was not on a gathering of saints. It was on mom and dad. All of a sudden, Cain and Abel have fought. Abel is dead. We've got that going on. Satan has tricked Eve. You know what I'm saying? The very first attack in Scripture was on a family. And that is still the play of the devil today. He attacks the family. And I just think that maybe God has sent us into our homes in this pandemic, into a holy haven, into a place of of oneness to gather us back as a family so that we can proclaim to our children and to each other as spouses and as moms and dads that there is a God who loves us right where we are and that he is with us. I believe that God uses us as instruments yeah. to produce his will. Um, and I say that because I look and I can say without a shadow of a doubt that I don't think that I would be sitting where I am today. I don't think you would be sitting beside me if it wasn't for your parents, if it wasn't for my parents. No. What's something that sticks out to you that, and, and you know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but is there something that that you can think of that just sticks out to you? I, and I'm very close with your mom and dad. Yeah. Um, but is there something that just sticks out to you that you can say and you can point back and say, if it wasn't for my mama doing this, if it wasn't for my daddy doing this, is there something? Uh, yeah, I was, I mean, I was raised. All we literally had was the Lord. Yeah. I mean, my dad quit his job making big money at Milliken to go full-time in the ministry. Yeah. And when he left there to go be a youth pastor for 150 bucks a week. And I have... That's tough, wasn't it? Yes. They drained their savings account. Yeah. They, they drained the college account. Everything was drained to pay off everything they could to go full-time in the ministry. You know, in the 80s, early 90s, making big money to go make 150 bucks a week. And I have literally watched the Lord fill our cupboards. Yeah. We would be down to a can of beef stew 
and some flour, and mom would make cowboy casserole. That was when we knew we'd hit rock bottom, when she pulled that recipe out. That's beef stew with biscuits on top. Yeah. And you go I think to, I've had that at your house before. <laughs> you probably have. Yeah. It became a staple. But you go to church or someone shows up and they start putting money in your hand or you find money in a, in a washing machine that you knew you didn't have a $100 bill for it to be there or someone shakes your hand and money's put there. And I've seen God provide year after year and day after day through that. And I, I can go on. I can tell you many stories of refrigerators not working and mom and dad lay hands on them and say, God, you know we don't have money and then turn back on and work. And the power of God doing mighty things, healing the sick when there was no money for doctors. And I can turn around and say, if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, right. tell me where would I be? And I'm thankful for that heritage because oh, they yeah. trained me not at church, but in the house. Yeah. In the house. It, it's, one, you know, I, I can go back right now in my mind. My daddy always set up on the front row. Yeah. He played the bass, but he always set up on the front row when the time of preaching. And my dad was given, the Lord used my dad with the gift of, of, of tongues, of corporate tongues. He would, you know, when the spirit would move in, the, in a message of tongues, my dad, God would use my dad. And I, 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 can, I can take you to the place at that church and I could see the power of God come on my dad. And I always admired that. Yeah. It, it, just, it just did something in me. It put him at a place in my life to where I seen that there was something different about him. Yeah. And, and I didn't have it yet, but I, I aspired to want to be like that. My mom, I would come in Scott and there would be times we, we rode the bus to school and um, we as poor folk, you know what I'm talking about? My kids get picked up every day, but we as poor folk, we had to, we'd had to ride the bus every day. Had to, before that we walked to school uphill both, both ways. ways. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I remember we'd we'd get off the bus and we'd come in and we couldn't find mama, but we'd hear. Her. Yeah, you could hear. Her. Yeah, and, and she's the, the bedroom's closed. Yep, and she's in there praying. Yeah. And um, that meant something to me, and that stays with me today. The impact, um, you know. I I remember as a kid. We were uh, studying about the talents, you know, in Scripture. And, oh, yeah. And I remember my mom, I can still see the, the wrapping paper. We wrapped up a, an empty box. She said, put your talent in here. Whatever, put your life in here. God wants everything you have. And so we just sort of put, nothing was in my hands, but I just sort of dropped it in there. And we wrapped it up. And she said, this is your talent. This is, and we're giving it to God. Right. You know, there's little things mom and dad did at home that you saw at home and it, it, then it showed itself at church to so your dad too. Sure. That, that really you and I can now quote Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way you should go. Yeah. And when they are old, they'll not depart from it. We're here today because our parents paved the way, shot us like an arrow. Are we old? Oh, no, we're in our prime. <laughs> I think we're old because we haven't <laughs> forgot what our parents did. But you know, you just said, it's not only that the, the kids are a gift, but they are arrows. That's what the psalmist said. It said they are arrows in the hands of a warrior. What what does as as an archer, as someone that is there's one thing that I know about that hunting and, and when I have a bow in my hand is that when the the animal that I am hunting comes out, when I am at a place to where I see it, I cannot physically obtain it without what's in my hand. Yeah. And there is a place that I want to be and I want to make an impact in, but I can't get there myself. I have to be willing to let something go. And that's powerful. That's powerful. Because we have, and, and, and this is what we're trying to get to. We're, we're trying to understand that, that God has put a calling on our young people. You know, we go back to old, old scripture and, and, uh, talking about Joshua, I was talking about this earlier when me and you was talking. When when Joshua was given leadership and Moses had died, the Lord looked at Joshua and said, "Listen, I've given you this land. Sure, land. I've already given it to you. Now you've got to cross the Jordan. It's time for you to go possess what I've given you. You go get a hold of, obtain it. You've got to put forth the effort. And here's what I feel in my spirit." Is, is, is can take place not only in this church but in our state and the movement, is that God has already given some of these young people 
the anointing yes. and the power of God, yes. the power of discernment, the power of healing, the power of tongues and interpretation of tongues. I believe that this, this platform right here has been anointed for a young person Gifts to preach healing. on one day. Gifts of healing. If, if we don't lead them to that Jordan and, and, and show them through our actions, you know, we, we've, we've got to get this right. Yeah. Um, so when you release that arrow. Yeah. You're shooting Jordan and Reagan, yeah. Nolan and Brinkley, further than you could have ever went. Yeah. And it's still your impact, too. Right. You're gone, but that's you. That's your heritage. But you're sending them down the road as our parents have sent us. Yeah. Your mom and dad will never impact the people that you're reaching. Right. But it was because of them. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and what is that? The stress of pulling the... the, the There's a lot of pressure. A lot of there. stress, a lot of pressure pulling the string, the the velocity of how that shoots from there and how they can get there faster than you'll ever get there. There's so much, so much power in that yeah. that parents are going to have to realize this is what God's called me to do, yeah. to deal with the stress so I can send my kids further than what, than what I could ever do. And understanding that, listen, if we're going to see them excel, it's going to take pressure. It's going to take pressure. There's no way of getting out of it. Right. They can sit in the quivers. It's up to us, and we can allow them to sit in the quivers. And... You know, I think it goes back to the home. Deuteronomy, Moses is, is telling the children of Israel, love the Lord with all of your heart. And he gives them all these great commandments. And he says, now, not only you, but then he goes in Deuteronomy 11, you shall teach them to your children. Yeah. Speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk, when you lay down, when you rise up. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that the days of your children may be multiplied. Write it on the doorpost. Write it over what the is he post. saying here? This is something that is important. Moses is, is writing this, and he's like, listen, this is important for you to remember. Yeah. And who's he talking to here? He's talking to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Is he talking to the kids? No. Who's he talking to? Who's he's talking who's he to targeting? The parents he's talking to the parents. That generation. Yeah. It's up to us. And, and I, you know, I, I'm not trying to put a heavy load on us, and I don't need to because it's already there. It's our responsibility to make sure that we're training these kids into, listen, if you don't have a burden for young people right now, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will convict your heart yeah. and lay this burden on you because we are in a day and in a time that our kids are facing things that they've never faced before. Listen, my kids, my son is graduating this year and will not walk across the stage as they have done for the last lifetime that yeah. I can remember. My daughter... Is, has been taken away in her freshman year, almost halfway through the year, has been stripped of her freshman year. Everything. These are, these are trying times that these kids have, are facing, and they need parents to make sure that we're stepping up and, and calibrating them and, and getting them on the right path because there's a lot of things pulling at them right now. You know what breaks my heart, Trey, is listening to kids say stuff like, well, mom broke up with her boyfriend. I had to go get in the bed with mom and tell mom everything was going to be all right. That's not the job of a kid. No. It's supposed to be the other way around. Mom's supposed to be in the bed saying everything's going to be all right when, sure. you, when, when, when you get through this. It is time for parents to raise up and say, this is not about me. This is about my kids. They've got yeah. to make it. You know, and that leads to my, my last point on, on when it comes to parents, and we're going to shift gears here in just a second, but... When it comes to being a parent and, and doing things right, it takes discipline. Discipline. Uh, and not just discipline our kids. I can, I can sense right now that there are some parents saying, preach that word, discipline. <laughs> it, listen, it comes, it comes with us disciplining our kids. Listen, yeah. spare not the rod. We, you know, no, don't, don't spare it at all. We don't need to spare it at all. Uh, we, listen, all joking aside, we have to make sure that we establish order in the home. And there are disrespectful kids out there that need to be taught a spiritual love and respect. And yeah. respect. And, but Scripture tells us here in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, it says, For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always right. And good for us because it means we will share in his holiness. Now, no discipline. Now, listen, it's, he's, he's not candy coating it here. He says, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. 
I agree 100%. Do, I, love, do I love a good whooping. I, you know what? That's right. I need to be a good whooping today. Amen? No, we don't enjoy getting whooping. Hey, Dad, guess what time it is? No, we did not want to get a whipping. No, discipline is not enjoyable. Why is happening? It's painful. But afterward, look at your neighbor, look somebody in the room and say afterwards. But afterward, there will be a quite... There will be a quiet harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Those who are trained, discipline has to be established. It has to be put into place in order for the harvest to come. We cannot expect to reap a harvest that we have not disciplined ourselves to to sow. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Um, And one of those disciplines, I think, is, is, there's, there's many, but... Um, spiritual disciplines. Why would a kid want to come to church if mom and dad's not dis- disciplined enough themselves to say, let's go to church? I think there's a 0.05% chance that, in a, that a male, sex male person will become a major league baseball player. Yeah. But if we're, we're putting baseball and soccer and football and AAU and, and all these other things before our spiritual discipline. Right. Some of us are more worried about our kids making the team than they are making it to heaven. Yeah. I've heard that. Yeah. You know, it's a great quote, but. And we, we only have, there's an 86% chance that you will stay a Christian or that you will follow spiritual disciplines if you are saved before the age of 18. That's powerful. Listen, this is, this is what is at stake here. This is, this is what is in limbo if, if we don't get this right. Don't expect your kids to be the spiritual leaders in the home saying, hey, we got to go to church. Mom and dad, get your tail up. It's time to get ready for church. No, there needs to be a dad turning the light on on Sunday morning saying, hey, okay, guys, it's time to get up. It's time to get ready for church. It's not the, listen, I know we have single families. I know we have single moms. And mom, if you're doing it by yourself, I applaud you and I'm praying for you. Absolutely. But if 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 a dad's in the home, dad, you need to step up and you need to you need to be the man of God that God's calling you to be. And, and we need moms and dads to to rise up and lead these kids. Parents, we need to make sure that we are using these arrows that God has given us. We cannot allow this gift to to turn into an heirloom. This is not a gift that I, I hate somebody giving me a gift and, and, and with the expectations that I'm not supposed to open this gift. Yeah. I don't want something to sit on the shelf when I know that it is to be used for something. And I, I, I believe that we need to make sure that we're allowing our kids to be the gifts and the weapons that they need for God. Uh, uh, do you have anything you, you want to add before we, we uh, transition here and, and go um, toward the youth? While we're doing that, uh, Pastor Up is going to be coming up. But while we do that, Scott, if there's one thing that, one last thing that you can say to our parents, if you can encourage them, if there's a plea, what would that plea be? One thing we've learned in the uh, Christian education world and the discipleship world is this. Listen to these numbers. When both parents attend Bible study, 72% of their children will attend Bible study in Sunday school when they're grown. Wow. If only the father attends Sunday school or Bible study, 55% of the children will when they're grown. But listen to this number. When you're saying that about dads, it jolted my memory. When only the mother attends Sunday school, 15% of the children will attend. Look at the impact there. If dad does, 55%. If mom does, 15%. If mom and dad both do, 72% will continue. If neither parent attends Sunday school, only 6% of children will attend when they're grown. Look at the impact parents have on their children. And so Malachi tells us that before the coming of the Lord, in Malachi chapter 4, he said, I will turn the hearts of the fathers That's to the good. children That's and good. the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Yeah. And, and so what I would like to leave you with is this. Parents, you are the most important thing in your child's life. It's not a teacher. It's not a best friend. It's not a BFF forever. It is you. And it is up to you to make sure that your children know that the number one thing in their life has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And that the power, listen, and, and I don't want to take too much time here, but we need more moms and dads that's not afraid to lay hands on our kids. That's right. And to plead the blood of Jesus over them. Yeah. And to war 
against things that are coming against them. We need moms and dads. Moms and dads, you hear me right now. I, I, I challenge you to walk into a room and, and to start pleading the blood of Jesus over your child's life, over the music that they listen to, over the things that they're watching, over the things that they're listening to that you don't know about, that you're not... A, a, I, we need to start pleading the blood and the Holy Spirit to, 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 to convict them if they're doing things that they don't need to be doing. I didn't um, get to watch He-Man or the Smurfs as a kid. My mom read the <laughs> same book, Scotty. <laughs> I enjoyed He-Man and the Smurfs, but all of a sudden, the, somebody wrote this this yes. book, and, and Gargamel yes. was a satanic name, yes. and my mom come in and turned cartoons off that Saturday morning. And Smurfette, there's no woman supposed to live with that many men at one time. <laughs> there is not. That is what my mama said. <laughs> That's the truth. That's not coming in my house. And as funny as that is right now. It's funny, but there's no power in Grayskull. No, there is not. It's there's only a, there's the power in the name of us, in the blood of Jesus Christ. And my mama was, you know. But that was a standard our parents raised us with. It didn't come in. This does not come in my Discipline. House. It discipline. was discipline. And, you know, I didn't like it. And, and that's, that's a word for some of our parents. What you establish, your kids are not going to like. But this is not a game. This is not a popularity not a contest. I'm not trying to win the approval of my, my children. I'm trying to win the approval of what I've been mandated. Now, listen, I'm, I'm all about you being close to your kids, but God didn't ask you to be a friend to your kid before he did to be a parent to your kid. That's right. And we need to make sure that we're doing our job. I want us to, I want us to, I'm, I'm going to kind of just sit back and I, I want y'all to kind of uh, run with this because this is, this is your area, area of expertise and, and Pastor Opie's doing a phenomenal job here at the church, but, I feel like I've got a a, a bead line or, or a, a topic if we could do it, and I shared it with y'all. But so this is what we've experienced, and you've experienced too—the power of God moving in a mighty way. We've yeah. seen it. We've experienced. We've seen the services. We've pleaded the blood. We've we've seen uh, people healed. We've preached messages. The demoniac set free. Absolutely. But guess what? It's time for the next generation. And we used to play this game when we was in, in, in schoolyards, and the game was simply called tag. And what happened if you got tagged? You were it. You were it. And, and you know, young people, tag. You're it. You're it. Um, it's, 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 it's not time for you to sit on the sidelines no more. This is, this is you know, so parents, I want you to 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 home in and help us right here, but this is this is for your young people. This this part is going for your young people, but I'm, I'm going to let y'all run with this. Hope you want to start us off? Do you, you have anything you want to say? Or Pastor Austin, rather, I've, we've known each other so long, it just it gets yeah. a little informal sometimes, but. No, I just, I, I guess I want to talk to the student that, that is listening right now, who is watching this, and I just want you to know that that no matter how, things look at this moment, this isn't the end game. That no matter how things may look at this time, whether you're dealing with loneliness, whether you're dealing with all these things that's going on around you with um, school being canceled and all these different things, the, the sports that you've trained for years and years for your senior year that are lost and all these different things that you're, I, I want you to know that this isn't the end game for you, that the plan that the Lord has for you is still there. And just like Pastor, Pastor Trey talked about um, it doesn't end here. It's it's a, a continual thing, and the Lord still the plans He has for you. No virus, no school being canceled does not change that. It doesn't. It doesn't change what God's plan is for your life. And 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 He knew that this was going to happen. And and I believe that through this, you're going to understand things that that past generations never have, never and, and that that you're going to be able to see things and, and know that, you know what, no matter what the enemy throws at me, no matter what the world even tries to throw at me, I'm going to be okay because God's hand is still on me. Yeah. So I, I just, I, I want to talk to, to mention that to you. And right that's now. powerful because, listen, there is pain that women do not have children unless they experience pain. That's right. Always a birth pain. There, there's always a birth pain. There is Listen, our church has never experienced the pain that it's experiencing right now. And from this pain, I believe that it's about to produce something Absolutely. through our young people and through our church. But. Absolutely. There's a scripture I've been um, <clears throat> using a lot with young people. 
In Hebrews 12, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And there's something I tell, could tell young people today is this. We we seem to be focused on where we were a month and a half ago, grades, and we were focused on school, and we were focused on volleyball and softball and workouts and wrestling and jobs and girls and boys, and we were focused on our phones and on social media, and we were focused on Xbox and PlayStation, and we had all these things that we were focused, but we really weren't focused at all. It was like everything was just everywhere. And, and so the scripture reminds us that this journey, young people, is, is defined as a race. But here's the thing. It's not a race against an opponent. Right. It's not a race against someone else. It's a race against you, against me. It's my race. I and mean, this race is against me. And, and scripture's plain. It tells us that if we're going to be it, if we're going to be tagged, hit me and tag me. If I'm going to be tagged, it's my turn. I've got to run. If you're handing me the baton, I've got to run. And the only way to win this thing is it's real plain in Scripture. One, lay aside every weight. And there is no way I can run with you on my back and carrying tray. There's just no way I can do that. And the problem is, is as in life we pick up stuff. And weight's not necessarily sin in this passage of Scripture because there's a comma, then it says, in the sin that ensnares us. But weights are things that hold us back, that hold us down, that, that sort of push us down, that hinder our journey, that hinder our, our race. Things like anxiety and depression and loneliness and fear and discouragement or breakup or something on social media or being called something or a bad decision or an unexpected death or status or um, something, a breakup, a parent's divorce, substance, things that, that just seem to hold us back and hinder us. Those are the weights that we as young people, that you young people are going to have to say, I'm not going to let that stop me because that, that's life. And scripture says, I'm going to shake this off. And I'm going to press on toward the mark of the high calling of God because I'm called. Young people are called. God is trying to raise up a generation of spiritual pioneers that says, yes, I'm dealing with heartache. And yes, there is discouragement. And yes, there is fear. But I'm not going to let that control me because here's what I do know. Very plainly, the scripture reminds us that the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them and delivers them from yeah. all of that stuff. That's, that's from good. the fear, from that's the loneliness, the discouragement, the wonder, the, the heartbreak, the pain. God delivers them when they cry out. But it's not only the weight, but then he says in this passage, and also we have to let go of the sin that easily ensnares us, that traps us. On my way over here today, I watched a, a, a white bird. I'm going to call it a lake gull since we don't have a sea around here. But it looked like a seagull flying there in Clemson, right over the 28 bridge right there. And it had a, some kind of like netting around its foot and it couldn't get up in the air because of the extra weight. And this thing now that's entangling its feet, it landed in the middle of the road. It couldn't fly. Wow. And I thought to myself, that has entangled it to the point that it's going to probably end up dead. But there's things in our life that's not only heavy, but they're entangling our weight and they're, they're entangling our feet and they're stopping us from moving forward. And that's sin, that's yeah. things that entangle us. And, and there's, you know, nobody ever likes to call out sin. So let's start with a small one like lying, you know, we, lying and gossiping. Because there's not that many 14-year-olds in Westminster that's done murder. We never but, struggled with that, did we? <laughs> ne not murder. I never struggled <laughs> with murder. If we did, we didn't tell nobody about it. We didn't it, tell did. anybody. We didn't struggle with murder. <laughs> but there, there are sins that entangle us. Yeah. And you know what the number one that every teenager is dealing with today because of this thing right here? Every teenager, boys and girls are like, are now dealing with the sin of pornography. Yeah. But that doesn't mean life is over. There's deliverance for that. Yeah. The sin of anger. You know how much anger is in kids' lives today? Why did that why did that bird man, that's powerful, Scotty. Why did that bird that bird did not go in with the intention, I want to get my foot stuck. No. It was enticing. It was it was something that that intrigued this and, and it's the same with our young people. This this can be so intriguing. The yes. things of this world. Are you seeing some of the things that he's talking about? Are, you're you're the youth pastor, you're the pastor over our young people. Are you seeing the things that he's talking about? Absolutely. And I, and I think one of the things that, that caught my attention, what you just read was, was a lot of times we don't, a student and student understand this, you're not walking straight for the sin. The right. heaviness holds you down to a place where the sin takes control. Well, the sin right. And so I think that, that, you know, in your lives that there's these things that, that are, coming across your, your your plates and you're seeing them and you're having all these opportunities and stuff like that. And I think that that 
um, can hinder us from this race and yeah. cause us to that sin is because um, we're allowing heavinesses to, to take control of us when they have no place, when they right. have no authority over us, but yet we're allowing them to hang around to the point where that leads us into a sin. Because, I, I mean, nobody wakes up one morning and says, you know what, today I'm going to go sin. It's, no. it's, it's, it's just something that, that um, we either become accustomed to or that we, we slowly make decisions that we cause us, it. yes, to get to that place. Yeah. And, and I think when you're talking about the sins, you know, um, pornography, um, you know, substance abuse. Yes, absolutely, and 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 not even that, but um, looking also as that looking at what other people think. I mean, understanding that that a person, another person's opinion does doesn't matter nearly as much as what the Lord's opinion of you is. Yeah. I- identity struggle. We're identity. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I like to say it this: how you view you is how you view others' view of you. Yeah. That's a whole That's lot good. of ooze right there, yeah. but. And think about the children of Israel. Again, the promised land. We sort of keep running back to this. Moses sends the children of Israel out to spy out the land, the promised land. Yeah. And they come back with a great report. There are grapes the size of basketballs. Mm-hmm. We've got a land that flows with milk and honey. Most people are allergic to something today, so it would probably be people lactose intolerant with milk and honey. But you get the point. we got grapes, we got milk and honey, things are great. But then they say this, but there's giants in the land. Right. And we were grasshoppers in our sight against those giants. And then they say this, but we were also grasshoppers in their sight. How do they know what the giants thought about them? Either they're bad spies or they went and interviewed the giants. No. What, they what are we keeping themselves ourselves? Less. What are we keeping ourselves because we assume yes. that we are not meeting the expectations of what other people think we should, you know? But when we focus on Jesus, right. that's, the, that's the other part of this. When we focus on Jesus, yep. we begin to realize if I'll just keep my eyes on him, if I'll keep my focus on him, if I can just see me through his eyes, I realize I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I do have an identity. Yeah. I'm the son. I'm the daughter of the living God. That's good. But I got to focus on him, focusing on Jesus. And then I begin to realize I'm more than a conqueror. I'm the head and not the tail. I don't have to be addicted. I can be free. You see, it's not what they call you. It's what you respond to. Yep. That's good. That's real good. And that's what we have to tell our young people. That's what you need to hear. But the one I'm speaking of, this Jesus, we can allow him to label us because he is unequaled in position. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You was talking earlier and we was was talking in the office and was, so a lot of Old Testament stuff here. Moses has died. Joshua has taken over. And Joshua is told by the Lord, all right, it's, it's time for you to cross the Jordan River. And on the other side of the Jordan River is the land that I've already given you. It's theirs, past tense. It's, 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 their, it's theirs. They don't, have to, they don't have to work to get it. It's all, they don't have to buy it. They don't, the Lord's already given it to them. However, to it. yeah, but they have to go and, and possess it. They have to go and obtain this. It takes them crossing the river. Now, I feel in my spirit that, man, I, I do. I feel the spirit of the Lord. I feel that, and, and let me make it personal, that my daughter and my son have been given something by God. Yes. I believe that God has anointed them. I believe that God is anointing your kids. Absolutely. And, and who's watching right now, if you're a young person, God has already given you something. Sure. However, what's in between you and what God has already given you is a Jordan. Right? Not not a, not a, my son Jordan, but the Jordan River. The yes. Jordan River was was what was keeping them from the other side. And the Lord said, "You've got to cross that Jordan at flood stage." At flood stage, um, when things didn't look good. So, what is is your Jordan River, young people? What are the Jordan Rivers that our young people are facing right now? You know, we've been talking a little bit about it, but but what do you see in our youth group? What are the Jordan Rivers right now that are? Um, I I would say. I said like obstacles. What yeah, are those obstacles? obstacles? Um, I, I would say, you know, some of the things we've already talked about. And, and, and I would just, I would say that there's a, a longing for more, but there's a, a, an excuse for why not to. Yeah. And, and, and in these, in, when we, they're at these Jordans and it's, you know, almost, almost like 
the children of Israel earlier where they were at the Red Sea and they, you know, there's almost a place where students are crying out and say, Lord, why would you bring me to this point just to kill me here when all along he wants to spread the Red Sea for them? You know, and so I think, um, you know, there's these different things and I think students are brought to this place and I think even right now is a good place to, to, to talk about is, is, is the fear of, of not knowing what's next and even though I know what's over there, the fear of what the, the, the river, what the Jordan River contains, is it can be scary at times yeah. because it is a change because they've never been there before. I've never walked in, you know, the, at this point, the children of Israel had never been actually inside the promised land. And, and even though there's been spies to tell how great these things were, they hadn't been there yet. And a lot of times the, the unknowing of what's the future it is, is what's scary. And, and um, you know, when it, when it comes to those, those kind of things, as far as the Jordans um, in their life, I, I think that's a, a major one. And then I just think um, a, major, a, a major thing is, is the world trying to tell them what they're supposed to be. Yeah. And even though they can see where they're supposed to be going, or maybe they know that there's something there, the world's telling them that's unattainable. That's not even a real thing anymore. That's not even a place that, that you can go. Um, and so once they get to that river, they're like, but everybody else is telling me I'm supposed to be going the other way. Yeah. The GPS is telling me that I made the wrong turn. The, the, everything's telling me I made the wrong turn, but, but this is what the Lord's promised me. Everybody's hearing us talk in promised land. I've, I've pulled up a scripture whenever you're ready. What? Our kids are like, well, what's the promised land got to mean to me? Yeah. And, and I, like, I like something you said earlier. Tell them why, why should they want to get to the promised land? What is the promised land for our young people? In Joshua chapter 1, verse, nine verses, the opening where the Lord speaks to Joshua. One third of these verses say these words, Be strong and of good courage, yeah. for I am with you. That's it. Wow. A third of these verses say that. Yeah. Be strong and of good courage, which lets you know there's going to be some tough things that happen. We're going to have to deal with some stuff, but be strong and very courageous because I'm with you. And, and so to, to answer your question, in, in this, what is our promised land? What is, what is their promised land? One, he said, before you were born, I knew you. Wow. Which lets us know there is a plan and a purpose. That's why he tells the prophet. Man, speak to these kids right now. That's that, powerful. That's why he tells the prophet, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were born, I had a plan for you. He said that I've got a plan for you that is good and that it's full of hope. And so your promised land is not just a corporate promise of a 21st century youth group or 21st century group of people, but your promise is what God has birthed you for and is the destiny that he has placed on your life from your mama's womb because he said, in the womb, I knew your name. Right. Before you were born, I knew you. In the womb, I knew the color of your hair. I knew everything about you. And he tells us, he goes on to say, for I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. You are a promise. And not only are you a promise, but you have a promise and what God has pre is preparing for you, He's preparing you for. Hmm. What revivals are in the future? What anointing, what power yeah. can we see? Every major revival around the world from the beginning, you know where it started? It started with young people. At Azusa Street, it started with young people. The major revival that, help, that, that happens over in England and Welsh, it happened in a Sunday school with young people. Yeah. The revival that took place in the mountains of, of Kentucky, and it, with, it, it happened with young people in a college class. Yeah. What I'm telling you is, is that the Bible says, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Right. Yeah. That is where it starts. That is where it begins. It's going to happen with our young people. I feel but our parents are going to have to get it in their minds. I'm not just raising a kid. I'm raising a generation. Yeah. Yeah. I'm raising the revival. Because you may be raising the next Trey Brown or the next Billy Graham. In your house right now could be the next person that sparks this revival that we're talking about. Be strong and of good courage. The Lord tells, tells uh, Joshua that three times. Be strong and of good courage. Yeah. Everywhere your feet touch belongs to you. That's like, powerful, isn't it? But we've got to let the hearts of the fathers and the children mesh again. Yep. Because it's like we've been against each other. It's their music. It's my music. It's their look. It's my look. It's do we dress this way or that way. Stop. There's something we have in common, yep. and it's a cross that's 
powerful. A tomb that's empty and a spirit that dwells with us. I think in Joshua when he's reading this, I, 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 I spoke on it when he's not, so that's, that's good stuff. He, he opens up and he says, be strong and courageous. Mm-hmm. Then a couple of verses later, he says, be very strong and courageous. Very. Then I think in, in two verses later, he commands him. He says, I command you to be strong and courageous. This is not a joke. It's a fight. And, and we are at war. And we need to make sure that we as parents are getting this right. And you as young people are not afraid to obtain, not afraid to cross that Jordan, not afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to use you because you are it. The baton is being passed. It is time for us to, listen, for a baton to be passed, that means the one that is passing it is running and the one that is receiving it is running at the same time. I'm not going to stop just because I want to pass it to my daughter. I need to continue to run while she starts to run. Moms and dads, don't expect your kids to take off if you're not giving them the example that they need to see what's got to take place. We need to have the Holy Spirit moving in, not just just our young people, not just our, but we need to move together. And, and it's time. The breakthrough's coming. The uh, People are prophesying. I feel it in my spirit. We, we're, we, we feel it here. Yeah. And um, it, it's time. Guys, do y'all have anything you want to add before we before we bring this to an end? Um, I, I just want to say, and, and we have talked about parent and we have talked about youth, but I, I want to talk for just a second and just talk to the young person who's at home. And maybe your parent isn't saved. Maybe your mom and dad isn't saved and you're sitting there and you're like, well, they're not leaving me good gifts. And I want you to understand that even though that, that maybe your, your earthly mother and father is not maybe putting on the best example for you, I want you to know that there's a heavenly father who loves you and he still has a plan for your life. He still has the exact same gift that each and every person has for you. He has a gift and he has a plan for your life. And even though that it may be um, that time where you know you hear people talking about you know we the, talking about parents being parents and 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 I believe that that God can't intervene in your house. I want you to know though that that God still wants to move in your life. He still has a plan for your life, and there are people that will pour into you and that will love on you and that will lead you um, until the place where the Lord brings your mom and dad to an altar and and and, and and is is oh. is saved. And so I just I, I want to talk just speak to that student and say that there's still a plan for your life that even though maybe mom and dad aren't doing what they're supposed to God still has a plan for your life and maybe you're the key to them maybe you're the key to their salvation can I I give you a testimony along those lines we're closing that was my daddy and my mama yeah my parents were not raised in a godly home my great my grandparents were, were good people but they were not church going people they were not Pentecostal people at all my daddy's family, are, I mean, are rough. And for all of you who may be watching, you know I'm telling the truth. I've, um, I've met them. In and out of jail, some of them. I mean, it's a, it's been a tough place. They give you the shirt off the back. They yes. Just, yeah. um, you know, alcohol. If you name it, it's happened in our lives. Brothers and his brothers and sisters in jail. But my dad, as an adult, made a decision. My mom's mom and dad, great people. We're not churchgoers, Easter and Christmas at best. They were in the secret service. They showed up secretly and left kind of thing. Um, Mom didn't grow up in this stuff. But my parents made a decision. You know what? I'm going to make sure my child. And so maybe you're that young person whose parents aren't in church. That's okay. Because now you have the decision. Because my parents made that decision. My dad got saved. Before my dad got saved, he was brawler in a bar and fighting and being left in ditches and uh, you know, before he got saved, but after he got saved, he said, I, I don't want that for my son. Right. Yep. You get that opportunity, young person. Yep. Maybe you don't have it as a parent, but you get to be that parent. And now because of what my dad did, now his brothers and sisters are in church. Yeah. His decision affected his brothers and sisters. His decision, his mom was saved before she died. His decision changed my life. His decision, now my children are in church because my dad made a decision. That's good. Yep. My mom made a decision. One decision can change an entire lineage. Exactly. And that's up to the young people. It's up to you. Listen, we're, we're going we're gonna to close here. And um, I hope that this speaks to, to the, the parents and the young people. 
God's not coming back for just a certain age. He's coming back for the church, yeah. and we're all a part of this. And But before he comes, more work has to be done. And I'm not trying to use it as a cheesy catchphrase, but you're it. It's, it's time. It's, you know, Scripture says it's by time. The alarm clock has been going off. It's, it's time to, to rise up out of the slumber and to be the church. And young people, I'm, I'm expecting an uprising, an awakening of the Spirit of God. And um, we're, we're looking into that. I want you, uh, Pastor Scotty, thank you so much for coming and being here. Austin, thank you for coming and being here. But in, in, in dismissal, I want you to pray a prayer over our, over our families, over our young people. Would you do that? Absolutely. Father, we thank you because you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, I said it earlier today, and I believe it. And I, the first attack recorded in Scripture was not on a church. It was not on a preacher. It was not on a youth pastor. It was, it was nothing. It was on the family. Because the family is the picture of God. The man and woman becoming one, the children. That's a picture of the, the Trinity, the triune Godhead, the family being one. And so the enemy has tried to attack that and destroy it and break it down here on the earth with moms and dads divorcing and children hating their parents and parents beating their children. Lord, it's just been a mess. It's the attack on the family from Genesis where Adam and Eve begin to struggle in the garden and, and they eat the apple and the enemy comes in and then Cain and Abel are fighting and Abel is killed. It's that same attack from hell. But here's our promise from you, O oh Lord. You are our strength and our portion. That you, O oh Lord, are our peace and our healer and our deliverer. That you, O oh God, stand at our doorposts and you stand in our homes. So, Lord, I just pray right now blessings over the parents, the yes. grandparents, and the children. I pray, O oh God, Malachi 4, that you will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the yes. fathers. That a multi-generational, a multi-generational revival and a multi-generational time of repentance will come to the Calvary Church and to the church around the world that, Lord, we will unite and not fight, that we will usher in the great revival that we are all expecting yes. and that sons and daughters will prophesy, that young men will dream dreams and old men will have visions, that, Lord, this great revival you've promised us would take place. Yes. Lord, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus. And I plead the blood over every home, over every child, over every young person. I pray, O oh Lord, as they put the blood of the lambs over the doorposts there, O oh Lord, in Egypt at the Passover. I pray, Lord, a blood, a blood stain over every home today, O oh God. As the, this plague passes over until the enemy leaves us, O oh God, I plead the blood of Jesus over families today in this church. Raise up a mighty army through this generation. Let sons and daughters prophesy. Let sons and daughters speak the promise of the Lord. And may they live in victory and not in fear. May they live in peace and not in discouragement. May they live in hope and not in hopelessness. Be near to us as your promise. You tell Joshua at the end of in chapter 1 verse 9, be strong and courageous as I've commanded you and I will be with you. Yeah. Lord, be with us is our, is our call to you and as we, we lean on your arms knowing that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, we love you so much. We thank you for being a part of our service today. And we are expecting great things out of this. Yeah. We're looking forward to what God's going to do. And, and I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're coming into this and the Lord's laid this time and this, this time for us to come together and focus on this topic. Because I believe that we're about to see one of the greatest movements of the church ever. And um, he, is equipping, he is equipping these young people. He's equipping us as well. But um, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for our church. Looking forward to worshiping with you again this coming Sunday. Um, I, I, I can't even express how excited I am. I have no idea what the Lord's going to do. We are just going to come and have a great time, and we're going to see God do a great work. Until then, we love you. We're praying for you, and we look forward to seeing you again real soon. God bless you. Have a great week.